Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, introductory public meeting um, to introduce you to the Open Government Partnership. I'd also like to welcome the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Brendan Howland, whose department is leading uh, on this initiative on behalf of the government. Uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Nila Hohi. I work with Transparency International Ireland. We are a not-for-profit, non-partisan uh, coalition of um, civil society groups. We have 100 uh, branches throughout the world. And uh, I guess it says it on the tin with us. We, we work for transparency, so therefore open government is a natural interest for us. TI Ireland is coordinating this uh, consultation, this initial out outreach with, with citizens and civil society on the Open Government Partnership. And the aim is to seek your input into Ireland's first action plan for, for open government. Um, we hope that by the end of the day you'd be willing to, 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 to play a role in this. And um, I know against the backdrop of recent events, the ongoing revelations from the ang Anglo tapes and the banking crisis. It's, it's easy to feel despair and um, cynicism, and uh, it's easy not to turn up to, some, to an event like this. So I think it's a testament to the openness of, of all of us in the room here today that you, you've turned out uh, in force and despite the sunshine, which is, which is a benefit. So um, this is a very mixed crowd, some of you are from the sort of data, uh, big data and technology um, fields. Some of you work with uh, groups that advocate for transparency and accountability. And it's really nice to see this sort of cross-fertilization of, of different groups and individuals who may not normally be in a room together. I'd like to run through um, the agenda very briefly before I turn over to, to a moderated discussion with the minister hosted by and um, Gavin Jennings, who hopped in a taxi this morning at 9 o'clock to join us and made it in 23 minutes, which must be a record. So I'll just run through the agenda initially. We're starting with this, uh, with this discussion on what, what we want to achieve with this initiative and with open government generally. And then we have four short primers from people who are active in this field, and they'll be introduced to you. And we break for tea and coffee and come back with, uh, with a Skype address by the Civil Society Coordinator for this, for this global partnership, Paul Masson, who's joining us from uh, London where he's working today, where he's working today. Um, and then we're going to break into the working groups um, after you've had some pastries to get your blood sugar back up uh, during coffee. And we'll, we'll, we'll have a 90-minute working group session before lunch. And then we'll come back into to plenary for for reports back from the working groups, but also for um, cross-fertilization of ideas, because I'm sure that the working groups will be looking at the uh, same themes and we'll probably be able to identify cross-cutting issues. So first of all, um, may, may I kick off with uh, the conversation with, um, with the Minister and Gavin, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a great audience discussion, and um, just to remind you that the event is being live-streamed. Um, Feel free to, to tweet. The Twitter wall is to one side here. And uh, given that it's been video recorded and live streamed, do ask you to, to keep it civil. I'm sure you will. So over to you, Gavin.
some big ticket items that are not you know, directly uh, being run by myself, like the proposal to, to move to a unicameral system, um, but others just to restructure uh, the way public business is done, uh, and we're going to obviously reconstitute um, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we originally brought it in, uh, the two current parties in government, it was eviscerated in 2003, we're going to restore that, and that we hope to have enacted this year. Uh, the whistleblower's legislation, um, I must beat up John when I see him later on, um, a, a stab vest apparently, not a bulletproof vest, but um, I, I was in um, Brussels yesterday, I was talking to the OECD uh, representatives, and they think it's a, the bee's knees, um, but that's published. Uh, we will have that enacted uh, before the end of the year. The Register of Lobbyists um, bill talked about as well. Um, a lot of debate about that. Uh, heads are published, um, and again, our objective is to have that enacted. We've done the um, Ombudsman um, legislation, broadened uh, very significantly the scope of the Ombudsman, uh, and so on. With the Inquiries Bill, is currently before the Oireachtas. Uh, not uh, the, the constitutional change that uh, I'd hoped for, but there we are. That's a different debate for a different day. But I think a very robust new capacity for the Oireachtas to have inquiries uh, within the confines of, um, of the Constitution. So all of that um, really would lead you... If, if that's your agenda, and we have a suite of things that um, are very low to attract actual public attention to, um, even when you're walking in here and you, you know, you're outside, you do the media interview with all due respect, they're interested in talking about abortion, not about this issue. Uh, but this is important. Uh, we have to get this right. And the Open Government, um, I heard our open government partnership, I heard about it. Um, seem to be the, the natural vehicle for us to be part of. We've applied for membership. It was initially taken, as you know, by President Obama on the margins of the UN General Assembly in 2011. Uh, we expect to be part of that, and we've opened the process of being part of that. Uh, we've tendered for um, the, the, the civil uh, partnership element of it. Uh, the department has, has conducted its own dialogues with the trade union movement, with government departments, with the business community, and so on. So we, we need to have a robust um, agenda for change that will not only uh, add to, but, but map out where we need to go to have a truly open uh, government and government business in the state. You didn't answer Obama's call initially. In fact, I think I remember you saying at the time that it would simply cost too much. Wh what changed your mind? Why agree to sign up now? Um, I, I think it was a learning thing. Y you know, you can be cynical about these initiatives. Uh, I suppose uh, you'd say President Obama calling for openness and transparency in the context of um, uh, some of the things that have happened in recent times, when uh, they're looking for international arrest warrants for, for whistleblowers. Um, so, you, you, I mean, is it worth being part of? Because if there is a cost in times of very scarce resources, um, is it something that is meaningful or is it a totemic thing that, that uh, you know, uh, who was it who said that if it's a club that uh, I'm a member of, I don't, uh, I don't want to be part of it? Um, is it Groucho Marx that said that originally? Um, it, it has to prove itself, and we did a lot of talk, uh, talking about it within the department, and I announced it in the context of last year's budget that we would apply because it looked like a worthwhile uh, process. The action plan, when will it be ready? Well, when will um, Transparency International have the, the, the civic element done, I'm told, in the autumn? Uh, we will have um, the, our consultations completed by the end of the year and the action plan by early next year. We've already talked to the Governing Council and they're telling us that the optimum time for us to formally join, have the action plan done, uh, and uh, have all proper consultation completed uh, will be April of next year, and that's the, that's the deadline that we're working towards. And when will we get the first chance to see if you have acted on the plan that you put forward? Well, that'll be an ongoing thing. This, I mean, the action plan is not a static document. It's a living document that, uh, once it's published, uh, should be um, organic in and of itself. There should be ongoing mod modification of it. There should be growth of it uh, and critique of it because some of the things we, we want to do uh, will prove to be difficult. Um, I found even in doing some of the things we want to do, um, you know, even on the FOI, there is real issues that you have to grapple with and find solutions for. Um, 
you know, the, the theory of doing things is easier than the practicality of it. Um, but I think we can robustly have a good action plan uh, published uh, and available for scrutiny by hopefully the end of this year, early, early part of next year, and certainly have it all done and dusted and be formally part of the Open Government Partnership, as I say, when the next intake happens, I understand, uh, in April of next year. I'll take questions well, from the, the fourth group, I understand. I'll take questions from the floor in just a moment. Yep. But uh, as a journalist, uh, and you mentioned the, uh, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, your government promised uh, to restore the Act fully if, you, if you're elected and to expand it. Now, you have expanded it to some extent, but you haven't restored it fully. I mean, the fees remain, for example, um, reduced, albeit, but they are still there. The Ombudsman said that those fees act uh, as a deterrent. Um, can you be believed on any open government promises when you've already backtracked on this most basic one? Well, again, um, I don't believe... I believe in dialogue on these matters, and it is... We're actually driving a, a very broad, very deep agenda. Uh, I mean, the previous government eviscerated the, the, uh, uh, the Freedom of Information Act. We're going to hugely expand it um, in scope and in dimension. Uh, there will be things that people will be critical of, but it is extraordinary that, you know, when you do Morning Ireland or anything else, it is only the discordant element of it. And I'm personally, having looked at it very carefully, made a decision that there should be some cost element of asking, of putting in a freedom of information request, because there is a, an actual cost in in um, in servicing it, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a, the, the the fees to date are a tiny proportion of the actual cost. Uh, so, you know, you, I don't want somebody coming in at night and saying, "Let me just now, I've nothing to do for an hour, put in f uh, f 400 uh, FOI requests." We can't plug up the system like that. All personal information, of course, will be free. That will remain to be the case. Um, but there will be some uh, payment required for some FOI uh, freedom of information requests made. There is also something else we need to do, and it's, it's something we're working on in parallel with the FOI, is a code of conduct. Because one of the difficult things is there's a different way of implementation across the public service in relation to FOI. So we're going to standardize that so that we have a common mechanism. But also, you know, there are journalists, um, I could name them uh, if you want, who, whose whole career is just simply shoving in FOIs. They do nothing else. And they're not even, they're FOIs that are very narrowly focused. Um, if, if you look at my own department, a big chunk of them is uh, what uh, TDs are paid or expenses or pensions, uh, which is fine. And that should be, as a matter of routine, put up there in the public domain. And that's what we're working towards in the open data idea. That shouldn't be. The, you know, it shouldn't be a sensation that people use FOI in a sensational way. Sometimes holding on to information for months to look for the right moment to plunk it in. The idea of open data is that, as a matter of routine, all public information is routinely accessible uh, to all citizens, and that's what we, we'd like to work. Can I give you specific? So take, if you like, the mystique out of FOI. Can I give you a specific example uh, about one area which is very restrictive to find out any information under FOI at the moment? Uh, and I would have worked in in the UK and in the North before, where uh, police forces there. Um, are much more open in terms of the information you can get under freedom of information. And these are police forces who are uh, under arguably far more threat, and certainly in the north under more threat from distance than they would be here. W will will, uh, will Garda data be, be more open under FOI or under whatever policy uh, that you pursue as a result of today? Well, I suppose to use a Garda phrase, I have form in that regard. Um, uh, I spent a big chunk of the last 10 years been involved in the Morris Tribunal. Um, I was on the hazard in both the High and Supreme Courts in relation to these matters. Uh, I published um, two pieces of legislation, myself in opposition, uh, the precursor of the Garda Ombudsman Bill, um, basically mirroring what happened in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I met the policing board in Northern Ireland, uh, and Nulo Lohan, uh, who was then police ombudsman, came to Dublin, spoke to um, my own team. Um, so I believe very much in, in changing it. We also, I also pr proposed at the time, in opposition, uh, as Justice Spokesman, um, I proposed that we'd have um, a, not only an Garda Ombudsman, but uh, some sort of Garda Council as well um, to, to oversee th uh, the police. I think that's part of uh, um, a migration to, to openness. So certainly, uh, except in the issue of um, the, the scrutiny of crime, as you've seen in the heads of the bill we published, uh, and Garda Shirkana will be part of the FOI. 
Um, is Gavin Sheridan here? Because I know he had a particular query in relation to freedom of information. Gavin. I suppose, I suppose the, the, the critical thing here is uh, in relation to the guards. The guards have sought a specific exemption for just administrative. Sorry, for the guards have sought a specific exemption for just administrative records, and that the commissioner would have no right uh, to uh, make a decision on what the difference between administrative and operational data is, or operational records. Um, what does the minister think of, of how the guards would approach this? Because the guards were left out from the original act, and they've been left out subsequently for the previous 15 years. Um, I, I, if you could just address the guards specifically. Well, I, I've just done that. Um, I think I've, as I said, track record in relation to this. Now, this legislation hasn't been debated in the doll yet, so we're going to go through the whole um, shaping of the legislation yet. Um, I'm hoping to have it published. Um, just we're coming to the end of this doll session, and there's an enormous pressure of time, either getting things on the cabinet agenda or getting doll time. But I want to have it published, so we'll have a full debate about it when we see it, the final model that's published, and we'll have debate about it as, as it progresses uh, through both houses between now and the end of the year. Uh, Gavin, just before I throw this open to other people, I know y you are involved in, in, in trying to get information through FOI, and I know how difficult it on is. What? On what? On NAMA. Well, the, the, I'm not using the FOI Act for NAM, I'm using the Access to Information and the Environment Regulations, and that's in the Supreme Court in October. But the, this again leads to the question of, of the fees issue you brought up earlier. Um, access to Information and the Environment requests are free, yeah. uh, upfront they're free, the appeals process is free, except for the appeals commissioner, no search and retrieval fees apply, and yet with FOI, when I tried to access, exercise my rights under that legislation, the fees exist. And the, the idea that the 15 euros acts as a barrier is actually unique in Europe. We're the only country that charges up front. And I don't think Ireland is exceptional compared to any other country in Europe that we feel that we're going to be flooded by requests. When I can send requests to the UK or Northern Ireland for free, and yet in my own country I have to pay, I don't think that's fair. Um, again, it's a debating point. We've already debated that within, because um, I've sent the heads of the bill. Um, you're talking about the current legislation. Uh, the fee structure will be changed, as you know, in the new legislation. So the next issue is whether it should be completely free or not. Um, my judgment call on it is that we, there should be some payment, um, because I, th I think we do need to have uh, some recognition that I, I, the processing, including the environmental information you saw about, it's not free. There's a cost. Um, I'm in the process now of downsizing our public service. Uh, 30,000 public servants have left. Um, I, I'm required to reduce the, the pay bill. A big chunk of people can be, can be involved in this. It is important work, but it's work that will, will dislodge something else being done in a shrinking public administration. And that's the truth of it. So there, there has to be some recognition of that in balance. Uh, and that's a debate we're going to have within the Oireachtas. But I hope that there'll be a realism as well. You know, everything should be free um, in, in, in an ideal world. There should be no fees for education, and there should be no fees for accident and emergency in an ideal world. But there are fees. Um, gentlemen at the back, can I ask you to identify yourself? Uh, it's okay. <coughs> My name is David Brown uh, I've been using freedom of information uh, for about 20 years. I think I was one of the first to use uh, the uh, freedom of access to information on the environment regulations, trying to get information on, on uh, public transport when I think you were minister at that time. Um, I want to read something out that um, uh, the uh, former Assistant Secretary General to the government said in 1953, six years ago. The success of any public policy depends no less on the intrinsic merits than on the quality of the public service that executes it. The civil servant's task is at any time a difficult <coughs> one. It will not be lightened if he fails to bring the public closer into his confidence. In shaping the civil service to the satisfactory discharge of its present day responsibilities, the public may reasonably expect to know how the official mind works and to understand the thoughts that animate it. Given that we pay taxes to support the full public service, why should we then pay further to pay to, to get uh, detailed information on the options that they are proposing to the government? Uh, the other thing I want to, I want to answer the two questions that are put up here. What are we trying to achieve uh, is the title of this, and what are we going to do about it? What we are trying to achieve is what the minister put his finger on, we have to rebuild trust in our way of governing ourselves. And listening to the minister, I'm afraid he's got caught in the hands of public servants who feel very simply that they govern and that 
we, the citizens, who transfer the power in elections to people like the minister, that we don't own the power. So we have to find means of designing, implementing, and monitoring, and using checks and balances to limit the scope for excess by the powerful. Uh, ministers, civil servants, elected, appointed, public and private, local, national, and transnational. And freedom of information was introduced in Sweden nearly 250 years ago in response to an era of corruption. And they have maintained it ever since and developed it. And for us to be starting weekly now with uh, uh, another act, we should be putting it into our constitution and we should also be putting citizens' initiative, for example, modeled on the canton of Zurich, into our constitution so that we can initiate law uh, rather than just wait for, for the civil servants and the government, which controls the dial uh, uniquely. And I think that the, we need these things and we need them now. Minister, do you want to respond? I do indeed. <laughs> You're a kept man, according to... Yeah, I just think he's wrong. Donald, you're just wrong. Um, number one, um, you read the, the civil servant, I don't know the civil servant you talked about, who regards, who, who, who read it, uh, who, whose total presentation of the public service was in the male gender, for a start. Um, some of the most dynamic people are, are, are female within public administration. Um, I am, uh, as an individual cabinet minister, entirely responsible for the decisions made in my department. No civil servant tells me what to do. So you're just wrong on that. Uh, it, it's nice to be able to say that, you know, because, I mean, we've had the three questions I've had are the same question so far. Uh, is there a fee for uh, FOI? It's something that I have a view on, and we see what the de debate uh, shapes on that. But the notion that that not issue negates all that I've talked about in the creation of a department, in all the legislation from uh, Oroctus inquiries to lobbyists, uh, uh, lobbyists and all that, all negated by that is quite clearly fanciful. And I know there's a purism about some people's view that, you know, you, you have to always, whatever is on, the, uh, on offer, like here this morning uh, on Morning Island in relation to the abortion debate, whatever is on offer is not good enough because somehow uh, th they'll get complacent. Now, I was a member of the government that brought in FOI here. Uh, it was eviscerated s s subsequently, and I intend to restore it not only to what it was when we brought it in in the 90s, but to extend it much more. We've already done that in relation to the Ombudsman's Act, um, hugely expanded um, the scope of it and the power of the Ombudsman. Didn't get much um, credit for that. You're always, it's always some discordant issue that somebody says that it's not worth all your effort is not worth a pinch of salt because you don't agree with me on that one, I one issue. You see, it, you suck the life blood out of people who are actually trying to push the barriers of change by that sort of an attitude in my judgment. I'll take one more contribution on this before I move on to, to some other issues to put to the minister. So the gentleman at the back there, um, I can just ask you to identify yourself. Right. That's yeah, okay. my name is John Fidler. I run a website called Caldea Street with which the minister may or may not be familiar. Um, one last at least partly an observation. Um, the, 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 I mean, at the risk of bringing up fees for a fourth time, which I'm not, not my intent here, but, it's a, but seeing fees, but seeing FOI fees, seeing FOI as a cost to the state is where I think the minister is profoundly in error. On, if for no other reason than um, FOI work led directly, for example, to finding out how much money the state was wasting in force, and the amount of money the state has saved as a direct result of that FOI work dwarfs, completely dwarfs all the money in the last 10 years that has ever been received by charging for FOI requests. My actual question, though, relates to open data. You've, Kildare Street um, went offline um, about coming up for a year ago, despite the fact that the minister's policy is that the organ branches of the state um, shall publish um, material in open machine readable formats. And after that became policy and after his department issued that advice to everybody, um, our national parliament completely disregarded it and shut off data it was previously publishing. How do we intend generally to enforce this? <laughs> because the um, baby steps thus far haven't been enormously successful in some areas. Minister? Um, we've now appointed uh, a new um, chief information officer. 
uh, who has come from uh, the Cabinet Office in London. Um, we are ensuring that there is a joined up approach across all um, aspects of government. Now, obviously, the Oireachtas is separate from um, from the executive, uh, although uh, I know people have the view that they're, uh, they exert too strong an influence on uh, on Parliament, and I'm I'm of that view myself, and that's why, in for, for example, in the inquiry legislation, uh, the empowerment is handed back to the Parliament, to the Oireachtas, to make determinations in relation to that. But insofar as we have um, uh, coordination and control, we certainly will have um, one view on it. And once we write it into a national strategy. Uh, we can ensure, at least through co through m pressure, um, that everybody, every agency of the state complies with putting uh, as much data uh, in as accessible a fashion as is technically possible, and that's the objective. When they don't, ultimately you'll talk to me, I presume. Now, um, I can't direct the parliament, but I can certainly influence everybody else in, in public administration. Minister, you were talking about the concentration of power in the executive, uh, and while we're here talking about open government and you say that you're perhaps uncomfortable with that concentration, in this government, power has become even more concentrated again. Uh, your, one of your biggest uh, decisions and work this year will be in formulating the budget uh, earlier than usual, um, which is now down to four people, four men. Uh, within this government, and despite promises that it would be a more public and a more consultative process, it has become even more secretive and reduced to even more people, one of whom is yourself. Is there not an intrinsic irony between opening up government and closing it down to just four people? No, I think you're a victim of your own propaganda. Uh, that's not the way the, gov the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the budget process works. Uh, you've seen the changes I have brought about in the way the budget is structured. Uh, number one, we had um, a, a multi-annual framework budget. So it's a three-year horizon now, both on the capital and on the current side. So people know exactly what is to be expended in each government department on a three-year horizon. Then we conducted a comprehensive review of expenditure. So all the options available to each line minister, or at least um, the vast majority of options, people can think of other things, but the vast majority of options that we could d discern from a comprehensive review of expenditure were published on my department's website. And I wrote to each um, line committee of the Oireachtas, health, education, transport and so on, and asked them to engage well before the budget in January to look at the options, call in the secretaries general, what are the options? And for them to actually bring in civil society, uh, users, what are the choices, what are the options we have? Uh, so there is a real capacity to do that. Now, bluntly, and I've said this uh, at the committees in the Oireachtas, <laughs> there is no enthusiasm for opposition members of the Dáil to start proposing alternative cuts. If we were in an expansion period and we were looking at what additional money to spend, the job would be OXO. So that particular formulation, that openness, that capacity is just not utilized to date. And it is completely untrue. It suits some people's argument, particularly people who are flying kites, to say that it's there's four men making these decisions. Every decision of, 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 of government in relation to the budget, and I've been a member of three cabinets now, have never been more openly discussed at cabinet than the decisions in this. Um, in this uh, government. We have gone through every decision individually to the full cabinet uh, in a way that certainly wasn't the practice in the past. Is Nat O'Connor from task here? I, I know that Nat had a particular question to put in relation to budget formulation. Um, just one, one of the questions I have is in relation to the, the budget data that's online. I mean, it's great that there's more data now online in the data bank mm. uh, in, the, in your department's website and Department of Finance, but a lot of the data is not machine readable. And indeed, even at the last budget, we found that the, the budget documents that get published are often their PDFs. You can't immediately take the data and do calculations on them. In some cases, documents systematically don't have page numbers so that you're going through all these pages on, on the vision. So the, I think there's a lot more that could be done to improve the quality and the transparency of the, of the, of the actual documentation produced at budget time, and particularly making it machine readable so that people can do calculations uh, on the basis of the, the, the facts and figures presented. I'm afraid I'm not a techie, so uh, if you give me any suggestions, uh, we look at it. 
uh, former Minister Eamon Ryan? You know, I, I, um, I agree with uh, Mr. Allen. He has the authority. And if I can go back to that question in terms of making all data available, to be very clear, and the benefits of that um, are myriad. It could be huge resource efficiency in, the, in relation to use of natural resources. There's going to be huge opportunity from open data towards uh, new applications which help us save, make savings in different ways. To take, again, the recent example, from my experience in the last budget data, actually there was much less data. The actual budget figures were, were reduced right down in terms of what actually was provided. So to be clear, what you're saying here today with your authority is that all data from the state, unless for a security or other reason, is it should now be accepted. And for example, that might be within your own department, that all budget items are right down to the last cent is accessible and available, which may help, let's say someone has a um, way of saving money for your department on a um, procurement. They get access to that data, they'd be able to show, here's how they can save you money. But I suppose that's the key first principle. Are we now working on a basis that the first, that the civil servant has to have a reason why they don't provide data down to the last cent? And does that come with your authority if they're not doing it for people to question? The data is already there, Eamon. Um, we publish uh, not only um, every budget line in the last budget and the previous budget we were involved with, right down to every vote, right down to every um, amount voted uh, on a subhead basis. Published. It's already out there. Uh, in relation to procurement, um, for the last two years my department has published everything we bought uh, in excess of €20,000. Uh, and we've uh, asked that be migrated right across the system as systems become available and, and, and do that. This is a journey. It's not, I think in the headline on the, uh, the documentation I got, it's not a moment in time, it's a process. Uh, but I agree with the concept that we need to have um, open access to all data uh, 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 as soon as that is practicable to do. Oh, that's more open because I'm sure there's some other subjects that we have to raise today. Yeah, gentlemen, there with the... Uh What's the comment? Um, There's a question. Uh, I'll put on later. Uh, the comment really is that uh, I just don't think this whole thing of open government has to start on a very much positive basis. I, I saw the feeling there's uh, quite a feeling of negativity and things have been done for reasons to find out what's going wrong or who's doing something wrong and so on. No. <coughs> I just think it's the wrong place to start. Uh, and I feel that the. the um, FOI to some degree, and I'm talking about as a man in the street, was primarily hijacked in some ways by, uh, this is a perception, right, by the media rather than the citizens, right? In other words, that people felt that uh, it was being used to, to, to pull out, okay, there's good, bad, and ugly and everything, right, in, in terms of information, right? It was primarily being used to, to pull out the ugly out of what was going on, right? And, uh, I understand that's where the media come from. They, they, have, they don't come interested in publishing uh, what Minister Riley has done well or what Parliament has done or whatever. It's to be what, they have, what, what problems are there, what are the expenses, what and so on. And I think it's an awfully negative approach. We're not really interested in that. And the citizens are not really, uh, they're really interested in what's happening in what good hospitals are there, what good, uh, as well as as the bad and the ugly, right? And that's the first thing I see. I think FOI has been hijacked to a degree, and uh, I think it was, it was much more left open to the citizens to, to look for information in their own private means. That has been overcome and, and, uh, by the sort of media on, 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 on FOI. That is, that's a general kind of feeling. I don't, I don't know what it's true or not, right? So I would feel that if we move on from here now, it really has to be done on the basis that it is a cooperative thing, right? But it's not just going to be a negative, nitpicking sort of an excess to find out A, B, and C. It is going to be an overall positive approach to, to open government, right? And that means a, 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 that we have to look at both the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And not just the ugly, right? That's a comment. Um, the other thing is regarding uh, uh, PSI. Um, but the sector information, and there's quite a lot of discussion about FOI, but uh, perhaps I'm interested in PSI, which is the release and reuse of government sector, not, not, not on a request basis, but on, the, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, the release of public sector information in all its 
for in machine readable format, right? <coughs> and we can, and the question was asked back at the back, we can take PDF out as being a machine readable format, right? So no, that is not a machine readable format. It is in something like XML or whatever. And that, that is that going to be part of, of, the, if, uh, of your plans? Um, very briefly, um, I, I entirely uh, I agree. There's two elements to the whole FOI debate. One is access to information, and then there's use of the information. Um, and you're right, a lot of things, you know, that should be a matter of just routine out there, but there's suddenly, we have uncovered that da 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 uh, And it goes to the, your second point. The idea would be to demystify access to information, because information that everybody has is no longer this great exclusive. And it should be a matter of routine that all the information that is now, I've got this exclusive by prizing open government through FOI. Um, and FOI should be used l less and less as we have, as a matter of routine, all information, as far as is practicable and safe, uh, and I mean safe only in terms of national security and other matters like that, or the prosecution of crime. Um, it should be as a matter of routine in, to, in the public sphere. Can I give you a tangible example and, and putting away my journalist hat and putting on my parents' hat? I have a four-year-old who uh, is hoping to start school in September, and if I was trying to find out information on local schools, what's the best one to send her to? And the method I would use would be no different to the method used 50 years ago, 100 years ago. I'd ask parents and I'd ask the principal. I can't find out any information beyond that. Why not? It's a very good question. Uh, one that I would like to have a better answer for. Um, there's enormous resistance to giving that sort of information. Um, constructed by people, um, sometimes with, good, with very good intention, um, but I think uh, not motivated by really uh, access to information and, and analysis of, uh, of outcomes. Now, one of the things uh, I've said repeatedly to this job is that we are very good at monitoring inputs into all lines of public expenditure, and we're very bad at measuring outcomes. I've changed that in the budgetary system now as well. Another change is that we have expected outcomes as part of the budgeting process to be debated. But again, we have to crank up the Oireachtas to, to get, get to grips with that, so that we're measuring what the outcomes are, and that will, should filter down to my own personal belief, there probably, you know, there'd be resistance for me saying it, but um, I think um, you should be entitled to know what the the, uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, of any particular investment in education is. I mean, one of the things I'm very conscious of is there are sectors now that where we invest enormous sums of money, and if we restrict it in any way, we'll be on Morning Ireland being beaten up. Um, we won't beat you up. In, but in terms of Nobody's asking. Nobody asks. It is almost taken as a, uh, that whatever issue arises, the answer is more resources. Not what are you getting for the resources you have. So, you know, you bring on uh, somebody, or uh, in, on the media brings on somebody and said, here's the, the problem. So therefore the answer is we'll add 20% to the numbers working here or to the uh, amount of money, as, uh, as opposed to saying, well, what are we actually getting for the money we're actually investing there? So outcomes are extremely important, uh, but they're much more difficult to, 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 to get a grip on. Because I know people will argue you can't measure, very hard to measure it with a, a tape. And you know the British Labour Party got into problems with this, the outcomes of education, because there's so many variable factors in the inputs. Uh, but there are some standards that other countries do, uh, and we should do that. And uh, the same in health, the same investment in disability sector, which if you look across the disability sector, you know, we spend um, in health about three, three billion on disability services, in education about one and a half billion, you know, you, you add transport and everything else. But it's not joined up to see, well, are pe people better mobile? Um, can, can they access public buildings? Can they um, fully participate as citizens? That level of, of, of rigour needs to be brought to expenditure. Um, I did see one gentleman there, uh, yes, with glasses just towards the side there with his hand up. Again, just to ask you to identify yourself, please. Good morning, Minister. Uh, Edward Stevenson is my name. <coughs> uh, on the question of transparency, um, <coughs> Quilcha uh, has bad form, if I can borrow your expression. 
Uh, is there any chance that you would use the new Doyle investigation powers to look into Quilcha in the context of creating open government, I suppose? Uh, and in a more practical uh, point on that, would you agree with Pat Rabbit that um, the publicly managed sustainable forests is a job-rich environment uh, which could help the domestic economy to grow? Um, two things. One, um, it will be a matter for the Oireachtas under the legislation that I'm bringing through the Dáil and Shannad to make that determination. It won't be a matter for me to determine what should be investigated. It should be a matter for the Oireachtas uh, on an, uh, an all-party basis to make those choices. Um, in terms of the specifics about Quilta, uh, I mean, we've one of the things we, we, we did in government uh, is establish New Era, uh, and it was a Fine Gael idea, and so I can't cl uh, uh, like claim for it. And I was sceptical about it. A new, um, st you know, state shareholding company, uh, uh, overarching organisation. But one of the things they did is they drilled down into the state companies, uh, and, for example, in Quilta, it was revealing uh, what they did, and that has led to the decision we've we've made now, uh, not to proceed with the with the sale of the harvesting rights of Quilta, uh, but to look instead uh, at um, the possibility of merging Quilta with Borden Amona to have a, a state bioenergy company, and that's, we'll have that work done by the end of the year. But uh, I'm just saying, uh, New York itself has been a great facilitator in lifting the lid on the way the, public, the, the state companies have operated uh, to, to date. Um, and I think that will, will continue across all state companies as a good thing. Uh, the inquiry issue will be a matter for the Oireachtas. Uh, again, another gentleman here on the side would ask just again to ask you to identify yourself. Andrew Jackson from Antashka, thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick points. It was first interesting um, that you mentioned there that Quiocha and Bordemona would form um, you know, a, a state entity, is what you referred uh, to it as. I currently have an appeal uh, before the Commissioner for Environmental Information where Bordemona is arguing that it's not a public authority for the purposes of access to environmental information. So uh, it would be very interesting um, you know, if they publicly announce that they are when they're merged with uh, with Quiocha, but they seem to flip flop on that issue. You know, they, they don't want to be a public uh, sector body uh, for the purposes of transparency, but they do in other uh, circumstances. And the second point is just to say that it's interesting that you're uh, amending the FOI rules, but one very important thing to address, and it will be interesting to see if it can be addressed as part of the Open Government Partnership, is the gap between law and practice. To give a, a tangible example, about a year and a half ago, I tried to get access to uh, the 1973 Aerial Survey of Ireland, which is a series of about 6,000 black and white photos of Ireland, the, the first comprehensive survey to use for environmental enforcement purposes. And I approached Ireland Survey Ireland, which has a, a monopoly on supplying copies of, of this survey to the public, and they said it would be 200 euros for a single photo uh, in electronic format, which would make it over a million to get the full set. And they then, I said, okay, I'm going to appeal this to the Commissioner for Environmental Information. And they said, uh, on the final day, as I was about to submit my appeal, we'll give you a special price. We'll charge you and Tashka 19,000 euros for a five-year license for two users, or 118,000 for an umbrella organization of environmental NGOs. Um, in principle, via the Aarhus Convention, as transposed into to Irish law via EU law, I definitely have a right to access that survey. I would use it. Um, for uh, the, the public good, for environmental enforcement, um, but at, at present I can't get it because they're charging a crazy price for it illegally. And my appeal before the Commissioner for Environmental Information is sitting in an enormous queue because the Commissioner was given that environmental information function without additional resources to perform that function. So I've been waiting now um, more than a year and a half for that appeal to be heard. The last time I chased it up, I was told the case officer hadn't even been assigned to the case. So there are serious practical issues even where you create a nice legal framework. Thank you. I'm sure that's true uh, in terms of um, the, 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 there's backlogs. Uh, I mean, there's backlogs in public administration because we have enormous financial constraints on hiring new people, and we have an embargo on hiring new people. Uh, and you know, whether it's special needs assistance in the schools, uh, or um, staff to support the uh, disability sector, or people to process um, uh, appeals to the um, information commissioner, all of these uh, are pressure points to making rational decisions about within a context of a shrinking public expenditure pot available to me. Uh, and no matter what function I go to, no matter what group I address, uh, people will want their sector to be um, 
exempted from any restrictions, and that's not possible. Um, uh, we expect and we're determined that the current constraints on finances are uh, not a permanent feature. Uh, th but we need to have um, uh, a culture that allows data to be there as a matter of, of routine so that you don't have to go through appeals and all the rest. And that's a, that's, I suppose that's a cultural change that you talked about. And we bring about that uh, through legislation. So I think legislation is an important first step. Running a little short of time, I want to take two further questions. Uh, just two people who uh, caught my eye there just while the Minister was speaking. A lady here um, uh, towards the middle who uh, had her hand up there. Uh, sorry, yes. And I'll take the gentleman with the beard after that. I'll, I'll get the two questions together if that's okay because the Minister is on his way to vote. Not, not that vote, but uh, another vote this morning. Anne Colgan. <coughs> just uh, in response to the point that, that you raised about the school information, when your child does go to school, you'll find that the Education Act, there's a provision in there that uh, pre prevents and supports schools who don't want to give information about the comparative uh, information on, on outcomes in schools. So if you can't get information about literacy and you can get information about the football team, you'll find that that decision has the support of the law behind it. My question for the Minister is about public consultation as one of the mechanisms that tend to be used to engage citizens in, in public policy. And we could debate for a day whether that's a form of tokenism or whether it's a valuable uh, instrument of, of transparency and influence for citizens. Just two examples that might identify some of the issues there is there has been a consultation in recent times with citizens about the forthcoming uh, negotiations between the EU and the US on trade. Uh, and that will be really important for citizens down the road. But if you went out into the street now, I doubt you'd find 10 people in Ireland who would even be aware of that. So that's an issue about how do people find out? Um, the, the second example is about uh, the consultation about property tax, which was uh, initiated by the Department of the Environment before the introduction of property tax. But when I asked the Department for a copy of that as a citizen, I was told I couldn't have it until after the Department, the government had made its decision, its policy decision. And that's not an unreasonable stance perhaps, but it's a question of how that kind of consultation data gets used and whether citizens can see how their influence is brought to bear on the public space. Thank you. There's a number of, I suppose, profound questions uh, enmeshed into that. Uh, we live in a, a representative democracy. Uh, so, uh, you know, the public sphere is represented by elected people who put themselves up. Not, I don't say, um, there's my opinion on everything. But people elect me in Wexford to trust my judgment. And they've done that, thankfully, seven consecutive times. So, you know, that is public participation through Parliament. Um, but there is, obviously, an alternative dimension, uh, which is important, which is allowing dialogues like this. And I think um, new technologies uh, allow for a much uh, greater uh, real-time consultation with people. Um, it certainly is impact, uh, impactful. For example, in the whistleblower legislation, um, I found the, the dialogue we had with, uh, with public so or civil society very important. Uh, the same with the lobbying uh, bill uh, that we published. Uh, we had a seminar last year. And from the practitioner's practical point of view, what is a lobbyist? Uh, it was really important because everybody wants to, if you like, have um, a control or an understanding of who is lobbying, but they don't have any restriction on my right to lobby, which is, you know, a balance. So it, it really, it, that sort of real engagement is important. Um, I would hope, as part of the way Ar the Oireachtas itself changes, uh, if we are to move to a unicameral system, um, to have a much more uh, um, open engagement with, with all people, uh, stakeholders, citizens, in relation to all law, so that it should be the norm for heads of bill to be sent to a committee and for a, a, pull, a full open debate involving everybody who, who has an interest in it to come before the committee so they can have 
all be heard before the bill is finally drafted. And that's what we need to move towards. Final question, just from the man with the microphone. Now. Thanks very much. Uh, Brendan, I thought you were underselling yourself and the, about the achievements of the current government when you didn't mention the, R, uh, the Irish Convention and its yes, ratification. Okay. And uh, uh, Andrew beat me to it by mentioning it. Thank you. But I do think it's, it's a really important one to flag up as yep. a model of given the access rights that it embodies, the rights to information, public participation, and access to justice. It's a model that could be applied across the many different government departments. And then I got concerned when Andrew spoke that maybe he deliberately didn't mention it because he realizes the implications of ratifying the Irish Convention. That the Irish government is going to be called to account by the Compliance Committee of the Convention, and that begins very shortly in the next couple of months. But I, I was concerned it didn't get na named, and it is an important element of, of, of transparency. Thank you. Um, you're right. I should have mentioned it earlier on. Minister, thank you very much. Apologies we didn't get to any more questions, but uh, I hope that didn't feel too much like an extended edition of morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you no, no, for your uh, time, and thank you for your questions. It's, it's helpful. I look forward. Um, I, I have to go back because... Um, if I don't vote um, from the order of business this morning, um, people will be drawing conclusions uh, from it. It's all hands on deck today, um, but I think this is a very important process, uh, and it is valued. Um, I, I know we have to overcome some degree of cynicism uh, in terms of what we want to do. Uh, the final thing I would say is this: you know, people say current government can be autocratic because we use the guillotine and push things through. We are living through a crisis. Uh, and a lot of things are required to be done now. But in parallel, what we're trying to do is do the needful in terms of fixing things that are broken, but at the same time create a structure that is fit for purpose into the future. Uh, and I can honestly say that my department, the below the waterline construction work that's underway in, in civil service and public service reform will be the most important uh, contribution that I can make uh, in, the, in, in, in the long term uh, to uh, putting Ireland Inc. on a firm footing for the future. So I'm looking forward to the job. Yes, sir, thank you. Cheers.